Hello and welcome to the Capitol Report on NTD Television. I'm Jack Bradley, in for Steve Lance. Republicans today failed to pass their short-term funding bill to keep the government open with a shutdown just one day from now. Right now, both parties are apart on a spending solution that can pass the divided Congress. This as calls for ousting Speaker McCarthy appear to die down. NTD's Melina Wisecup reports from Capitol Hill. Melina, uh, first tell us about that vote Republicans took today. This bill that the House voted on today was a short-term funding bill to keep the government open through the end of October, but it also included some changes to border policy. Speaker Kevin McCarthy hoping that these border policy provisions would be enough to shore up the support needed within his own party, arguing this point shortly before today's vote. I can't understand why someone would side with President Biden on, on keeping the border open. But this vote failed with 21 Republicans voting against it, causing some tensions within the Republican Party. They killed the most conservative position we could take um, and then called themselves the real conservatives. They made a bad vote. That's my position. Some who voted against the bill told me that the process is botched. We, were here, we should have been here the whole month of August working on this. September 30th comes around about this time every year. And yet, this is where we're at. It's 7 o'clock at night, the sun's going down, and we don't have lights. So now let's panic. And that's what we've done here. We've waited too damn long. And all I've seen is failures. We need to do our job, which is pass appropriation bills, and then none of this is an issue whatsoever. Bubbling up around this spending fight and the potential government shutdown, we've seen reports that some frustrated members in the GOP are considering taking a vote to oust Speaker McCarthy. But today it seems like that push has lost steam. Are you going to continue to introduce that motion to vacate next week? Well, my focus right now is on these single subject spending bills. We're going to have to deal with the fact that we've had failed leadership, but right now I'm singularly focused on getting our appropriations bills up and heard. But even if the House does pass all 12 of those appropriations bills over this weekend, there's still a challenge in that Democrat-controlled Senate, which is going to refuse to bring those bills to the floor for a vote. The only solution here is for both chambers in this divided Congress to come together to find a government funding solution that can actually get the support needed from both parties as well as get President Biden's signature. Reporting from Capitol Hill, Melina Weiskup, NTD News. California's longest serving U.S. Senator has died. Dianne Feinstein died at her home on Thursday night. She was 90 years old. NTD's Arlene Richards reviews her legacy and what we can expect to happen in the Senate. Senator Dianne Feinstein was considered a trailblazer, not only for her historical 31 years of service in the U.S. Senate, but also for her commitment to her positions. Her death on Thursday evening at the age of 90 has sparked heartfelt commentary from her colleagues, staff, and friends. Senator Dianne Feinstein was one of the most amazing people who ever graced the Senate, who ever graced the country. You know how we all refer to each other as my friend from whatever state it is. Honestly, frequently that's not true. Uh, but Elaine and I were actual friends of Dick and Diane. When they were in town together, we would frequently have dinner together. Feinstein, a Democrat, is remembered as the longest serving female senator. Uh, senator Feinstein was a legend. She was an iconic public servant, and she earned and held the trust of voters throughout California for many years. President Biden said in a statement that she was a powerful voice for American values. Feinstein became known for her tough stance on gun control and for passionately advocating for legislation. She wrote the 1994 ban on certain semi-automatic rifles. After it expired in 2004, she continued to push for its revival. Diane made her mark on everything from national security to the environment, to gun safety, to protecting civil liberties. The country's going to miss her dearly. In 2021, Feinstein supported President Biden's efforts to improve relations with China. She had been a defender of China since becoming mayor of San Francisco in 1978 and supported granting most favored nation trade status to China in 2000. Her final years in the Senate were marked by controversy as she suffered from failing health and refused to step down. Her death now puts pressure on California Governor Gavin Newsom to appoint a temporary replacement. He had originally vowed to appoint a black woman to fill the seat, 
but recently he changed his mind. That said, it's my job, it's my responsibility. If we have to do it, we'll do it. Interim appointment, I don't want to get involved in the primary. So no, you would not appoint anybody I would on want to that, is, that is filed for this race? It would be completely unfair to the Democrats that have worked their tail off. That primary is just a matter of months away. Feinstein's seat is up for re-election in January 2025 as Senate Democrats face a slim majority. Leading Democratic candidates expected to run for her seat are Representatives Adam Schiff, Katie Porter, and Barbara Lee. Feinstein's chief of staff, James Sauls, said in a statement that she left a legacy that is undeniable and extraordinary. Arlene Richards, NTD News. Following Senator Feinstein's passing, California Governor Gavin Newsom will appoint a replacement to fill her seat. Who will be the one to serve out her term? And as calls of resignation continues to surface from both sides, what lies ahead for Senator Bob Menendez? To discuss, we sat down with national political strategist Brian Seitchik. Brian Seitchik, welcome to the program. So great to have you on. Happy to be here. Thank you very much. So with Senator Feinstein's passing, California Governor Gavin Newsom needs to find a replacement. Who do you think is going to succeed her? Well, he's very much limited his options, Gavin Newsom. He, uh, he said at the start of this process, when it was a possibility several months ago, that he was going to nominate a black woman that would serve as a caretaker. So that really sort of slims the pie here. That leaves us with Secretary of State Shirley Weber, who was appointed to the position a few years ago and then won re-election in 2022. San Francisco Mayor London Breed, who was not incredibly popular despite being the mayor of a very, very, very blue city. You have state controller Malia Cohen. You have Los Angeles Mayor Karen Bass, but she just got elected mayor of Los Angeles. Uh, spent quite a lot of money, went through a bruising campaign to get there. Not sure she wants to give up the mayor of LA. You have Barbara Lee, who doesn't really fit the test because she's running for the seat herself. And either she would have to agree not to run or Newsom would have to decide that he didn't want a caretaker. Uh, but I think the surprise pick here, frankly, could be Oprah Winfrey. Uh, I know it sounds crazy, but she is obviously a, a prominent African-American woman, incredibly accomplished. We all know that Arnold Schwarzenegger was the two-term governor of California. Uh, so it's not like they're immune to celebrities uh, having political leadership positions there. But I think the one thing we have to think of when we look at this pick is how does this impact Governor Newsom's future national ambitions? We know he wants to run for president. It's still possible he runs this cycle, but it seems pretty unlikely at this point. So how does this pick affect his, his run for president in 2028 and making sure that he is able to capture that black vote. We saw how helpful that was to Joe Biden uh, in the 2020 primary campaign. Slow starts early, but the black vote in South Carolina really helped him. Let's also again look at how much a lack of black support hurt Pete Buttigieg. So while the pick is certainly critical, I think we have to look at it through the prism of how is this going to help Newsom in the future? Is uh, Newsom's stipulations that he won't choose someone who's vying for the seat in the election, is that going to um, damage his, uh, his popularity? In some ways, because I'm sure uh, to try to secure that African-American vote in the future, they would want him to nominate Barbara Lee. That would give her a tremendous advantage being the incumbent headed into the primary next year. So uh, he's got to walk that line. Let's also understand that this, is, uh, this, is, this will be his second Senate pick. He got to replace Kamala Harris before. Uh, he nominated the then Secretary of State. So he got to nominate a new Secretary of State. He also got to nominate an Attorney General who got a, a cabinet appointment by President Biden. So Governor Newsom has had a lot of picks here and African-American women, a real stalwart of the, the Democrat base. Uh, they are not that pleased right now. They were very angry that he didn't pick a black woman to, to uh, replace Harris. So he could theoretically give Barbara Lee an upper hand in the primary campaign. And if he sticks to uh, sort of the, the, the qualifications of his announcement, he's going to take that opportunity away from her. So either way, it's a, a pick is a big deal. It's a great power a governor has. But considering his national ambitions, he does have to weigh how this is going to impact his future. I want to move now to uh, Democrat Senator Bob Menendez. Uh, he's facing a federal bribery charge of uh, charges, and um, he's continuing to serve in office despite calls from officials within his own party to resign. 
Um, what is the current state of his indictment and uh, what can we expect in the coming days? Well, first of all, this does prove the notion that you can't teach an old dog new tricks. This is Senator Menendez's second indictment in a decade. Uh, you'd think some people would learn a lesson, but I guess he's a uh, he just feels that he's uh, Teflon and untouchable here. Uh, I know that in the last few days, several Democratic senators have called for his resignation, including the junior senator from New Jersey, Cory Booker. But frankly, that feels like a free pass for me for Democrats. They know he's not going to resign. He didn't resign when he was under indictment uh, in the last decade. There's no indication he's going to do it again. So it's easy for Democrats to sound tough on these things. At the same, t uh, without any real chance, I think he's going to resign. But let's also take a look at it from a, a practical perspective. They don't want him to resign. They need his vote. They need his vote to have 51 votes in the U.S. Senate. They would be down to 49 if Menendez were to resign. So uh, when the cameras are around, I'm sure Democratic senators talk about his resignation and, and the importance of character. But at the same time, maintaining their gavel ship, maintaining the majority is of critical importance, uh, especially as we head into an election year, uh, to make sure that Democrats can get their judges judges through, uh, try to move some legislation in the Senate. They want to make sure they have the, the gavel in those committees. Right. So how important would his vote be for the, the party, especially now that there's a looming government shutdown? Absolutely critical. That's really why I don't think there's any chance he's going to resign. They know he's going to. Re they know he's not going to resign. But it's easy to call upon him to do so, uh, so that they can look like they're they're stewards of good government and and honest and accountable elected officials. Brian Seitchik, thank you very much for your time. Thank you. Thank you for watching the Capitol Report. If you want to see our full broadcast, check us out at EpochTV.com.